the public sector. I think there's a quasi relationship here that need to be developed today. And we're going to get into those kinds of things. So, okay, I think the best way to, to begin the, the subject is to kind of bring up, you know, focus on, you know, the major issue today of your compatriots, uh, the people in your generation that are moving on into the mainstream of housing. You're coming in with a lot of preconceived ideas and some hang-ups about, you know, what, what is good housing. I'm not certain you people are typical. You've had some exposure now that most Americans don't have uh, at your age in terms of this whole housing situation. But the typical uh, couple, their young marrieds or even singles that come into some of our housing subdivisions today, come in with their, with their programs in, in mind. And it really kind of uh, looks like this, that they could design a house and that they could have what they really feel they ought to have. You would have all the amenities that life has ever offered them. They, most of our, our young market comes out of uh, uh, pretty nice housing. There's bathrooms and bedrooms and garages and dining rooms and living rooms and you know, all the amenities that go into a housing and that's what you're all programmed for. And when you move into the the end of the mainstream and you look for a housing opportunity, you're apt to kind of want, you know, at least what your parents had or what you're used to. And when we see young people come in, they kind of really, when they get first married and live in an apartment for a while and they want to go out and buy a house, they come at us with this kind of an idea. You know, here's the house I want. It's got all of these factors, you know, big house, garage, living room, dining room, family room, three or four bathrooms and all of these things. And they've got an income that can support about a $20,000 house. Well, we have to appraise them that that house won't come in at $20,000. In today's market, it's about $89,352. And that costs considerably more than what they can afford. So we take it back and we make a $20,000 house out of it, and this really kind of symbolizes, you know, where we're going with housing today. We're, 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 we're necessarily having to shrink housing to fit the economic envelope, and I want you, want you to remember that factor, because it's going to be two of the major points that I'm going to dwell on in terms of what, what kinds of, of, of things do I, the builder, entrepreneur, control in the delivery process of housing. You're going to see that I don't control a whole heck of a lot, but I do control the size of the house. We have another industry that you may not have studied, you may not really be aware of, that would put wheels into that box and call it a mobile home. And that's another kind of housing, and it certainly is an alternative to housing. Uh, even today in the mobile home business, you know, they're trying to make them look like a house. You've got your wheels, your license plate, your curtain signals on there. That identifies it. But the guys like to hang a little manser, grow up a little fake brick, put the shutters on it, paint it white and black and make it safe. Well, that's an industry trying to move on into, into this area and providing people with alternatives. I'm not saying it's good nor bad. I particularly, I, I personally don't believe that it's good housing. It doesn't really build itself. It isn't built to a standard that I find acceptable at all in terms of lasting for the life of the mortgage and all those standards that we're used to in the real estate business, but it is an alternative. This kind of housing represents today between 20 and 25 percent of all new housing starts in this country today. Last year about 500,000 mobile homes were manufactured and lived in, 2 million 300 and some odd thousand uh, single family and multi-family real estate uh, programs were developed. So we had about 2 million 800,000 housing starts that become mobile homes in this country last year. 2 million 800,000. That's the biggest building year this industry has ever seen. Our, our second biggest year was last year in 1971, and prior to that it was all the way back to 1950. It took us 21 years to get over 2 million housing starts. The need was there, the demand was there, but the ability of our, of our marketplace to accept and to allow the variety and the range of housing to exist wasn't there. So it took us all that 20 year, 21 year period to get housing starts up to and equivocal with need. Okay. I'm going to talk to you, this is a little bit of philosophy, and this comes free with the morning. And as a speaker, you have a license to kind of to, to go at the, the crowd in whichever uh, position you would like. I title this thing, and it's been around the country a few times, it's called I've Got Mine and You Get Yours. And it really begins this whole question of attitude. So let's focus on the problems to begin with. We're going to isolate on about four or five problems that are true, whether you're in a new town environment, in a downtown environment, in a suburban environment, or in a rural environment. These problems are basic to the issues today of the building fraternity, the building industry. And we'll, we'll kind of start with the population problems. And we, you know, we're kind of getting uh, off guard right now because everybody's telling us that, gee, there ain't going to be a population problem, you know, with the advent of the pill and the advent of people not getting married. 
uh, so young and so early, and the fact that we don't have large families any longer, we don't got a people problem. Facts are we do have a problem, and I began to isolate on this problem in 1970, when uh, in Minneapolis and St. Paul we had the, the population uh, factors uh, you know, provoked again for us through the census. And it began to say a couple of things, that we've got concentrations coming, and that's what new towns are. New towns are, again, a, a kind of a reconsternation of a concentration of people in a specific place where we can provide services and amenities. You know, why is the Minneapolis and St. Paul metropolitan area growing? Why is Milwaukee and Madison and Chicago and Detroit and New York and Los Angeles and all the major metropolitan areas in the past few years growing? For a couple of reasons. First of all, yeah, we have more people. And we've got uh, a need for people to live in these concentrated areas. Here's where all the action is. Here's where we work, here's where we educate, recreate. And we do all these kinds of things. This is where the action is in the city areas today. So I speak to you as a builder that's working in that city environment, city suburban environment. And if we want to wrap about it at the end about, you know, why aren't you downtown Minneapolis building houses, we can talk about that issue. I, I think we'll be able to parlay some fears there that, that keep uh, builders like myself out of the, out of the Minneapolis, St. Paul, or out of the downtown areas. But the facts are that we've got a concentration of people they're still moving into the metropolitan area. We've had, you know, in-migration from the rural side, and everybody wants to live where the action is. That's basic. Okay, 1970, we stopped the clock. We begin to start counting people in Minneapolis and St. Paul. We finally got a million eight hundred thousand people as of that particular date in this seven county. This is a five county figure in this five county SMSA. Now the Met Council and a few other guys started projecting a few years ago, and they had us by 1985. We're going to have about three million people in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Well, they did then begin to take into consideration the new lifestyles and the new social factors which are not promoting, provoking large families and early families and early marriages and all those things. In fact, we even build houses for guys today that don't get married. But anyway, they, re they readjusted their, their speculation and they're speculating now that we're going to have 2,670,000 people, uh, 111 to be exact, by the year 1985 in the five county metropolitan area. That's an addition of 850,000 new people. And I've got to look this up. I'm not exactly certain, but I think it's larger than all of Hennepin County. So I would guess that in the next 15 years, between 1970 and 1985, we will duplicate in terms of population thrust the entire county of Hennepin and probably throw Scott in on top of it if you want. Okay, that's a problem for us, and I believe it's a problem that we, you know, the people in my business, the people such, people such as yourself, you're part of this, you're part of that number, and you're coming on into this area of housing. I think it's the responsibility of that power structure, the people that make decisions in terms of where we're going to build, what we're going to build, how we're going to build, how we're going to finance, and all of these kinds of things on housing have to take into consideration. Problem number one is basic. We've got people, we've got people coming, we just can't bury our heads in the sand and say people are going to go away, people don't need a place to live. That's myopic. But that's exactly the attitudinal condition that we have in this country today, be it new town, old town, downtown, or suburban area. We've got an attitude of I've got mine, you get yours kind of situation, and we're not too concerned because we're not relative, we're not affected. Who's not affected? The people that are making decisions aren't affected. Most of us are reasonably well housed and reasonably affluent. We ain't worried about you guys too much. Okay, let's break that down a little bit. Let's take another look at it. I got concerned because I said, gee, if we got that many new cats coming into the mainstream in the next 15 years, let's take a look at them. And we find that in 1970, we've got over 48% of our population under 25 years of age. And I guess that makes up for most of you, except the doctor and I. We're the Neanderthals here. But anyway, we might get into that next classification. We've got 48% of our population young, under 25 years of age in 1970. Significant factor, a significant problem for us as a city, as a state, as an industry, as a nation. I stopped and I looked a little bit more. I said, okay, how about the over 45? Because I think there's some similarities between the under 25 and the over 45. And everybody always wanted to know what those similarities are. You guys, you know, you're about 4,000 years away from each other. But the problems are there are some similarities. 26% of that population in 1970 in this SMSA was over 45 years of age. So what do we got? We've got a bimodal population on one side, we've got a very young group, half the population, and on the other side we've got a we've got an older group, the empty nester kind of group. 
that really were, you know, your forebearers there. And we've got a bimodal situation. Those of us that are in the middle, the cat between 25 and 45, we're making most of the decisions. Most of us walked into housing opportunities in the 50s and 60s and were reasonably smug about it. We got in the way of lower costs of construction, low land costs, low taxes, low interest rates, and we're sitting there in our baronial estates, two-story white houses with black shutters, reasonably, reasonably sophisticated and rather smug to these issues. That we've got to house these young people in a fashion that meets their lifestyle and their economic ability, and we've got to house these older people that are moving on into retirement where you have suppressed incomes and you have lifestyle changes and they don't need that growing on the state any longer, we've got to react to these issues. And we're not. We've been sitting around for the last seven or eight years now uh, discussing it, debating the issue. I quite frankly, and I've been involved in most of the debates in this city with all the study groups and task force and everything else that's come down the pipe, and I quite frankly a little tired of studying it. I kind of like to get out let's get something built. Let's get this housing plant. Let's get this urban plant moving. Okay, what are the similarities? All right, basically these. And when you know where you are right now in terms of your economic club, you ain't got nothing. You're just coming into the main street, probably don't even work. But when you do work, you're not going to start off at a big daddy Warbucks. You're going to be sitting down there at the bottom end of that so that economic ladder earning, you know, eight, nine, ten grand a year, whatever you whatever you earn today as a startup, college graduate, you can get a job. But anyway, you've got the, you've got that similarity. You've got a, you're at the bottom end of the economic ladder. What happens when you retire? Your income is suppressed and you're at the bottom end of the economic ladder again. Family size, these formations that come out of this young group, what are they? Two people, one and a half people, 1.2 people per family size. What do we have over here? Empty nesters are one and two people households. Well, when you start adding economics and you start adding family size and you relate it to housing and subdivisions and communities and cities that we're going to build, we have to begin to consider that these people have a lot different analog and a lot different standard than I have. I've got three kids and, you know, two cars and all a big fat cat. But that's a, that I can't really base my lifestyle on what I think will prevail for these people. And that's exactly what we're doing. Okay, so that's the problem. Two problems so far. We've got population and we've got a population uh, skewing to the left and to the right. And I think those are issues that are gonna, we're going to live with this decade. And until we begin to answer them, I think we're going to continue to have frustrations and problems coming out of River City. Let's just break it down once more. One guy got up and said, you know, so what? I said, so what yourself? Let's take between now and 1985. We've got, I took a 15 year period and I stopped the kids at 10, moved them up to 25. We've got 521,000 of them coming in. Now, if they just all get married together, we've got 250,000 housing starts in this area in the next 15 years. I'm not a mathematics major, but if I can divide 15 to 250,000, I suppose that's about 15,000 housing starts a year just for the new people that are moving in. If we don't get any more in migration, and we don't get into any of the other problems that we're going to talk about. Okay, we've got a very definite, unique population configuration, not just in Minneapolis and St. Paul. I could take this chart, chart for most uh, northeastern and northwestern cities in this country and find the same kind of relationship. We've got a young nation. And we've got a nation that's getting older, but the people in the middle that are making all the decisions are pretty smug and coy about uh, not really understanding or being too concerned about that factor. Let's take a look at the next issue then, income. Because your ability to live wherever and to absorb housing is relative to your income. We find in 1970 that half of our households, and our households meaning husband and wife incomes if they're married or what have you, We've got 50% of, of our households in this metropolitan area are less than $11,000 a year. You don't feel so bad anymore, do you? 80% of our households earn less than $15,000 a year. And again, we can say, so what? Well, let's find out. We've got the problem then of the young and the elderly and the poor not, you know, not having any club to begin with and not having enough money and, and, and economics to move on up that ladder. I'll get back and I'll relate to this issue in a second about what that income will buy in housing. Okay, we've got a problem of population, we've got a problem of people, we've got a problem of, of almost a zero clout consideration. Let's take a look at what happened. This is an old chart that I didn't bother to update it. These figures have changed substantially. But 1969 and 1970, over 60% of the new housing starts in Minneapolis, St. Paul, cost over $30,000. 74% of the housing starts in this area cost over $25,000. Now that's a significant, I wouldn't rather write it down, but I'd remember where we're going because I'm going to tie it back together. 
you could say, okay, if you can't buy a new house, buy an old house. Well, the old houses in that particular year, 1970 average across the board, $23,500. Okay, remember we got an income and, a, and an ability to, to absorb housing relationship. And if my next slide is right, thank goodness. Well, we've got a $23,000 home today for you to qualify via the lending fraternity, via the lending uh, uh, underwriting principles, you have to have an income of about 11 to 11.5 to acquire that 23.5 home. Remember I said 60% of the housing starts in 1969 costs more than 30,000, which means that for the most part, half of the households in this, in this metropolitan area are shut out of new housing. <coughs> and almost half of them are shut out of existing housing given that average. Okay, we've got a problem then. We've got, we've got costs, we've got economics of housing. A little bit, uh, is it that bad? Oh, it's pretty good, right? Okay, but we'll say you're never had We got, you know, we got, we got this uh, problem of, of the cost of housing, nobody else dare leave, right? We got this problem of the cost of housing then not measuring at all with the incomes and the abilities of people to buy housing. I don't mean to be nasty, I was up late last night, I don't think. He, he, he okay. has that, he has it. Oh, no, I know he has, you know, it gives me a chance. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a look at the next situation. You know, I'm, going to, I'm going to forget to add all of these up, but the next situation, real estate taxes. And you might say, well, you know, that's an old issue. That's right, but it's a very significant issue today because the way we, the way we began to, to tax uh, and, and to raise revenues for operating our cities and our suburban areas today is a very regressive tax. I'm not telling you anything you haven't heard before. What do I mean by regressive? We make the guy that earns a little bit of money pay as much as the guy that earns a lot of money depending upon the value of the home that he's in or the value of the apartment that he in. It's, it's basically very regressive. And I think this is a situation that this country is going to come to grips with sometime this decade. It's probably going to be formulated out of people such as yourself when you're tired of being cheated. Necessarily so. Let's see what it means. Let's take the typical apartment for you young people and where people that are prior to buying a house right after moving out of their parents' home, if they have one, uh, are confronted with. And this is a situation that exists, and we began to we'll put some numbers on the board because we began to see how tough it is. A $12,000 typical two-bedroom apartment used to cost about a year or two ago about $12,000 to build. We used to be able to rent that for $200 a month, times 12 is $2,400 a year. But our cities and our, and our counties tax that real estate at the rate of 25% of that net revenue, or gross revenue, or that $12,000 apartment unit will pay $600 a year in taxes. Now, if you own a $12,000 house, you're probably going to pay about $200 worth of taxes. To get the, you, you can own about a $30,000 house in some suburban areas and pay only $600 in taxes. So the problem is we really walk to the guy that's got no club. We really take advantage of the guy that can least afford to pay the tax. What do we have in apartments? We got mostly people without kids. We got mostly people that are old with, and their children are gone. They present no burden at all to the school system. They literally present very little burden at all to the community. And our bill departments never have. But I think it's an atrocity when we can, as a, 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 a the power structure, can decide that we can get to these guys because they don't represent anything. You know, they don't come down. You guys don't come to the city hall and say, hey, well, taxes are too high, I'm not going to pay them. No, you pay the rent. You don't like it, you move out and go somewhere else. Okay, we've got a whole world of renters today that are being taxed at a rate much in excess of what the good guys in the White Houses with the black shutters are taxed. And I think that's an issue. And I think it's an issue, a regressive issue that's going to have to be considered because that is one of the major implications in terms of providing a full range of housing opportunities for all people in this country. Okay, we've got the real estate issue. Let's talk about the housing inventory problem. And that's where we're getting some new towns, in town, new towns, out town, out of the sticks. Minneapolis and St. Paul last census, we had 588,000 housing units. Built prior to 1920, 185,000 of them. 185,000, or almost a third of our prior housing inventory in this SMSA were built prior to 1920. We just know they're falling apart. Here's an example of it. You know, Bill ain't got much more economic life. It's going to have to go. Well, anytime you get a house that's over 50, 60 years old, it's had. Now, we can't go in, we know the expense and the problems of rehabilitating these houses, although there are many programs that have been designed and have failed in this quest, but I think we have to be concerned about it because it, 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 it puts a heavier burden on this whole housing issue. 
We got people, we got incomes, we got real estate taxes, and now we got an eroding housing inventory. And Minneapolis and St. Paul isn't any different than, than any other city west of the Mississippi. Cities east of the Mississippi, toward New York, and the east coast have got a much more serious housing erosion problem in inventory. So it's an issue that the guys in the middle sector better be aware of. We not only have difficulties in assessing and bringing people into new housing, we're going to have some compounded problems because of the old that's falling out of inventory. Okay, the problems then in summary and are young people and inventory and incomes and real estate taxes, which uh, perfects and costs that are too high. The real big problem is I see it, because I, I opened this presentation by saying I think the issues are solvable if we want to make them solvable. But the reason we can't right now is that we've got a whole lot of people, the haves as I call them, I'm one of those guys, that cannot, will not, or are afraid to change, or don't care, don't know there's a problem. And I believe that's really where we start this, this decade, really where we start this whole housing uh, process, is by beginning to make people aware of the problem, by beginning to maintain the pressure that we must maintain if, in fact, we're going to house all of this country, all of the people in this country, in a reasonable fashion, as the 1949 Housing Act said we have to, in a suitable environment. You know, we've been talking about housing in this country since 1934, and that's before most of us, including me. Anyway, 1934, we had a Housing Act, and we said, you know, it's, 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 it's the conscience of the nation arose, and it said, we have to produce a decent home for every American. Pretty good deal. FHA popped out of that, and a few other things came down the pipe, and we began to build some housing. But we began to build a lot of middle-income housing, a lot of middle-class housing, because that was the big need in the, six, in, in the 30s. We had a pretty strong middle sector growing. And that Housing Act had to be reiterated in 1949 with the, uh, the infamous Housing Act that created much of the housing authority and uh, most, of the, most of the gutty wherewithal programs that have come down the line in the last 20 years. But it said, we not only need a decent home, we need a suitable environment for all Americans. Okay, next 25 years, we still didn't get all the job done in 1968. We have another housing act. And in this housing act, we said, hey, we need 26 million housing starts in the next 10 years. We got about the decent home and the suitable environment. We just took that for granted. But we've been reciting, we've been reciting housing as an issue since 1934 in this country. And we've done a great job as a nation in terms of housing in America. But we've done the job for the people that have the ability to speak out and get it done. For the fringe areas, for the, for the old, the young, and the poor, quite frankly, right now, we're not in any position at all to worry about you or be concerned. And we're really kind of abdicating. And I think it's in that abdication that's going to bring on some problems. I got my new pictures. There's the building. That's me. You know, we're, you know, we're literally the old me. You know, which way do you want me to go? I want to go this way or that way. I'll go anywhere there's an opportunity to build and try to make a dollar and try to keep myself alive and my company in Africa. That's the guy, you know, he's looking for opportunities, basically. And now let's just see what he can control. You know, you don't really give us much credit at all. At least the, the nation doesn't give us much credit at all. George Brown and President Nixon, a few others said, look at those dummies out there. Costs are so high because they can't control themselves. Well, I'll show you exactly what we do control. I'm going to destroy a myth this morning about the relationship the builder has to this whole cost spectrum. And then we get down to the real issues where housing exists and get off the kick about the builder's a dummy, doesn't know where he's going. I grant you we're dummies. You know, we're working with the old, we're working with an evolution of housing. People want straight walls, level floors, right ceilings, kitchens, bathrooms, garages, they want all of that jazz. We provide that in the best fashion we can. It's a very highly competitive business, but we are an amoeba and we keep on looking down the pipe for, for opportunities. And let's get into it. We, can, we tend to control some of the land principles some of the labor and some of the material factors, and outside of that, we don't control a whole lot. And let's get into it. I did this chart a couple years ago, and I got some information out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics and FHA. And it goes back to 1951, and it carries it up to 1969, the year I did the chart. I was interested in the makeup of a house. Now, if you buy a house or you rent an apartment, you can really go on these statistics because they haven't changed that much in the last couple of, uh, couple of years. The, uh, the house is made up of uh, labor and material primarily. That's the box itself, the physical thing you walk through the door and you live in so you don't get wet. We got labor and materials. In 1951, the average FHA house in this country was 932 square feet large. You know, that's about the size of this room. It uh, cost $9,780, and 70% of the $9,780 was in the box itself. 
Now there's a value relationship between brick and mortar and sales price that's pretty significant. It's almost a 70 plus percent factor. All right, don't worry about the rest of the chart for a moment, but move up to 1969. Now the average FHA house, these many years later, uh, cost $23,534, but it's a 1,232 square foot house, and it has a garage, and it has land improvements under it that we never considered back in 1951, like water, sewer, street, curb and gutter, and an old boulevard tree. You know, those, all those things have been programmed into housing because we wanted to upgrade it, make it more viable, make it more convenient, make it more purposeful. But anyway, we began to destroy our relationship a little bit here in terms of value, uh, structural value, to uh, sales price of the consumer. It's down now to about 56%. The big areas that went up were in land, overhead and profit, went down, unfortunately for me, and financing costs, very significant factor. And when you buy a house, that's what it's made up of. And we're gonna back into a, a situation right now because I wanna destroy a myth. Let me go back to that 23.5 house, this house right down here, 1969, 23.5. And in 1969, we had a tough finance year. We had 8% interest. We're going back there this year, by the way. We could get a 25-year mortgage, and over the life of that mortgage, you would pay back if you bought that house for nothing down. Principal interest, taxes, and insurance of $230 a month. Just about a 1% factor, and that's still a guideline that you can kind of use today. 1% of the price of the house is, is approximately the monthly payment that you'll pay if you don't put anything down on it. But anyway, over the life of the year, you would repay $79 in principal. Now, principal, is a reduction of this $23,000, right? Now, it's, there's a little economics in here. You're gonna have to stay awake because if you miss this point, we shot the whole morning. We got a $79 factor times 12 times 25 equals $23,500. Over the 25 year life at $79 a month, you buy that $23,500 box. The rest of all of this stuff is added on to make it happen. Interest on the loan, taxes to live in River City, and insurance to keep the place from burning down. When you get all done, you got a $230, $230 monthly payment. Okay, let's go into this principal area. Let's find the house. Let's find the thing that I work on. Remember, I work on a house. The brick and mortar, the roof, the ceilings, the kitchens, the bathrooms, and all that other stuff. We break the house down. We've got structure, land, overhead, profit, construction, financing. Right back to the other chart. Okay, the box itself, the structure itself, constitutes $44 a month of that $79 principal payment, or if you want to use it in another sense, the box, the house itself, constitutes less than 25% of the total monthly cost of housing. Now that's true whether you rent or you buy. So when everybody began to point fingers at the building industry and said, hey, why don't you guys get like the automobile industry, get out of that arcade on-site on, on construction practice of yours and bring housing into the manufacturing environment. They didn't know, the dummies, that we were only working with that on 25% of the total monthly cost of housing. It was a subterfuge, in a sense, to take the real issue out of reality. The real issues were taxes, insurance, and construction financing, and permanent financing, and all of those other issues. And the whole world in 1969 laid on the building industry and said, hey, it's you guys' fault that a house cost $23,500. Okay, it cost $23,500, but as of the, uh, in terms of the monthly cost, it was less than a fourth. 75% of the rest of the cost of housing to you monthly is another area that nobody's been working on. Okay. I want to show you the, you know, the, the neatest house in the world, to break up this monotony for a moment. I was coming down Highway 65 out of Mankato. I was down speaking to some students in Mankato one day, and I couldn't help. I went by a housing subdivision. And there a guy was building some houses back there, and he put up a sign, he had the goal to say that those houses were FHA designed, but he had to put the sign right next to a toilet. Now, if you don't know what that is, you haven't been in the construction business for long. That house was, that house was not only FHA designed, back up 40 yards was Minnesota approved. <laughs> <laughs> At 65 miles an hour moving down the highway, you don't know if you should stop, get a drink, buy a house, or go to the bathroom. <laughs> That's a lot of sight pollution, too. Land use and zoning. The next area that we have some control on, okay, summarizing that point, we do control the, the, we do control the quality of the house and the, and the amenities that go into that house, but if in fact we want to reduce the price of that house in terms of your monthly cost, uh, 230 bucks, I can only work on $44 of it for you. Now that doesn't give me a lot of room. What if I can save 10% by being more efficient 
by building in the manufacturing environment or what have you. 10%, five bucks a month, big deal. Now it's 225 instead of $230. We're working on the wrong end of the stick when we're saying the builder ought to get more efficient, ought to get himself into a plant, get a bigger hammer, get sharper nails or whatever, I don't know, get glue, fiberglass. Nobody wants to live in pressed cornflakes houses yet. Everybody wants to live in two by fours with sheet rock and hardwood and oak and you know, all those nice things because we don't trust any house that's not made out of those things. And that's, you know, that's an evolution that we're not gonna change overnight. People have a norm that they want, and we'll not accept anything else. So the, the answer is not in manufactured housing. I want to make that point before I forget it. The, ma the answer is not in manufactured housing. And I've got all the scars to prove it through my last experiences in two different manufacturing environments that there's very little that we can do in manufactured housing that's going to substantially reduce the cost of housing to the consumer because we're working on the wrong end of the stick. Okay, the only way that we can, and we're going to get to the point to reinforce at the moment, the only way that we can substantially reduce the cost of housing is by making housing smaller. We go all the way back to that second slide. If we can reduce the basic square footage of the house, I can deliver you a smaller house. But now we're going to bring up a problem, and we're going to tie it in later, about making housing smaller. There seems to be all kinds of difficulties in making housing smaller. But before we do that, let's talk on the other issue that the builder has some control over, and that's land use. And in your study this quarter, and, and wrapping back and forth about uh, new towns, uh, you're really talking about a land use issue. You know, how do we how do we bring more land onto the market in more intelligent fashion to get the job done better? How do we build a better environment? And all the jazz that goes with that discussion. Okay, land use and zoning. Uh, I'm not going to get into the legal ramifications of this, but there's a body of law that came out of the 19. 15, 19, 20 era, somewhere in there, it's called zoning. Zoning was a codification of what was there. All of the guys that lived in that period said, hey, what I live in is reasonably good and safe and sound, and I want to make sure that nobody can come in next to me and build anything else. So they developed a, a rule of laws. There are police powers. These police powers are handed from the state down to the local entity. And now we're going to take those powers back someday because the local entities, the local suburban entities primarily, have made a mismatch of this police power at the deference of housing all of us. And I believe that's going to be a major issue this decade. We're going to get it resolved, maybe not in my lifetime, but we're going to start this decade. We're going to have to reverse uh, the worst set of laws that have ever been established on the books. You know, a case has not been heard at the Supreme Court level in the federal, in the federal courts on zoning because it is such a miserable, bad set of laws. There's, you know, there's, there's a lot of discussion that could be had on this, and when you get into this whole new town phenomenon or in town, downtown phenomenon, you'll be able to have some fun with it if you want. Okay, but land use and zoning controls, they, they, work, in, they work together. There's why we had, you know, that's a codification of what was there back in 1949. You know, some, I used to live in a house kind of like that in Richfield. But you know, here's an example of some heritage. We've always said that we've got to be very rigid in our housing because we can't let you know, we can't plunk something down on the ground and then be sorry about it because they're hard to move and you can't get rid of them. So we say we've got to have some certain laws and we've got to have some subdivision rules and regulations that we can guide and direct these builders by because if we don't, the dummies are going to make chaos out of things. So we say every house has got to be 35 feet back from the front curb, 5 feet back from the house on the left, 10 feet from the house on the side. We've got to have our roads exactly 66 feet wide. And I asked a guy one day, I said, why 66 feet wide? Look, you could drive an Atlas missile down there at 65 miles an hour. It invites you to go fast. Look at that tunnel. Wow, you can get that car going down there 85 miles an hour, but you hit the top of the hill and run over five kids. I said, why 66 feet? And the engineer said, well, it's a unit of measurement. I said, what is the unit of measurement? He said, it changed. He said, when we got off the boat at Plymouth Rock and started moving west, we brought with us a unit of measurement called the chain. It happened to be 66 feet wide. We've been laying out streets in this country since 19, since 1680, 66 feet wide. You gotta have a 66 foot street. Okay, you know, I guess so. And uh, we got 66 feet streets. The argument still prevails today in River City. Going for a zoning. You want to change the street width? You want to do a little better job? You want to reduce the cost of housing? You want to make that street a little narrow and really make it more palatable and livable? Put a bend in it, make it 24 feet wide. You won't drive an Atlas missile down at 65 miles an hour. That makes common sense. But not with the old rigid middle sector there saying, hey, I've always lived on a 66 foot street. And what I've always lived on is good. I'm a good guy. 
Okay, I understand that, but that's the problem of attitude that we've got to attack. We've got to change it. That street costs a lot of money. Who pays for it? That cat right there. You know, you got it. All I do is put it in, mark it up, and hope somebody can come over and buy it. I'm not very smart. What does it mean? Okay. With the with the the pressure on on costs and the fact that the only way that I can reduce costs substantially is to make houses smaller, I'm going to do just that. We're going to build smaller dwelling units. And remember the first couple of slides of population? I said we got a lot of young families coming in the pipe. We got a lot of older families moving out of the pipe, and they've got a, they got some similarities in income and in, in family size. Today we have a phenomenon. There is an opportunity for us to build smaller units for people. Their needs aren't nearly as baronial. Their appetites aren't as you know as large as ours were in the 50s and 60s. And there's a whole market of people that will accept a smaller home. That's one way to reduce the cost. And we're going to put more of those people on less land through our land use uh, operations and land use controls. Now, if we can do this, build smaller houses and put more people on less land and do it intelligently, now we can begin to, from the private sector, begin to offer younger people with moderate incomes and older people with moderate or zero incomes housing opportunities. Now, nowhere along the line have I talked about anything other than moderate housing, moderate incomes, because from the private sector alone, there ain't nothing I can do to service the low income or the poor. Nothing. I need help to do that. And we just got all the signs coming out of the East that we could afford right now. But two weeks ago it said, we ain't gonna help. You gotta do it yourself. Okay. The issues then we as we you know we kind of beat this thing to death. Um, when you start talking about population and incomes and ability to absorb and all of those things, you talk about the builder's responsibility, what can he do? Yeah, I can build smaller houses. I can do a neat job today. I can do a lot better job than I could 20 years ago. And I can put more people on less land and then I can cause some, some assistance in this economic uh, structuring and bringing the price of housing down. That's the only, those are the only two areas that I control. Nothing else. Somebody else has got to do the job. Okay. Yeah. This is from another, these are, different, these are houses where we put more people on less land and we, you know, we make them smaller. Okay, let's go to, Let's go outside this area now of builder control and talk about uh, the kinds of assistance we're going to have to have if we're going to house everybody in a fashion that that 1949 Housing Act suggested. Look to the federal level, and I look to the feds for one thing, money. The federal government controls a capital pool. What's a capital pool? That's a big bucket of money that everybody runs to whenever you want to buy something. And housing gets to that capital pool last. Why? because it's long-term, low-interest rate kind of money. And if you were a guy with a lot of money, and you had your choice to, to lend money to that guy or to this guy, and that guy said, I want it for short-term, and I'll pay a lot of money for it, and I'd say, I want it for long-term, and I don't want to pay a lot of money for it, you're going to lend it to that guy. And that's exactly what the capital pool does. We've got such an appetite in this country. In middle America, our fluency has driven us to this capital pool at unbelievable rates. The cost, uh, not the cost, but the factor of money need uh, is represented today in inflation. You know, we've got a tremendous demand. We've got places to go and things to buy and people to see. We've got all of these things to do and credit. We can just go out and buy anything we want. And we do it. We attack the capital pool. There's still only so much money printed in this country. Okay, little housing walks up to the pool last, and if there's anything left over, we get it. Well, I say it's a responsibility then, because we can at the local level, I certainly can as a builder, and I know the banks downtown Minneapolis can, or St. Paul, the federal government has to establish the policies and the priorities in terms of the money and the capital pool. And I believe that if, in fact, we're going to substantially reduce the monthly cost of housing to people, whether it's through rent or through ownership, you gotta subsidize it. Now, if you, you know, I've been doing this for two years on this stupid, uh, I've got my name, you're a vendor, and I know these facts, and if I can't leave you with anything else today, it's that. That when you look to housing and the delivering process, look over the top of the builder. Yeah, I, we're not all white, we don't all wear white hats, but the facts are that we control very, a very small portion of the monthly cost of housing. Interest rates are the largest single factor, and real estate taxes are the largest single, single factor that make up that high cost of 
of, of living in a house or renting an apartment. And I'm suggesting that if we're going to substantially reduce that inequity so that we can begin to house moderate or low-income people, you've got to subsidize the interest rates. And I think they have to provoke new financing vehicles. Okay, that's the charge of the federal government. You might say there's 50,000 other things they can do, and I don't believe any of it. I think that's the area that they ought to operate in. Let the private sector then come to the task in producing the kinds of housing that people will want and the kinds of communities and cities that people will want. But let's make the money available. It's an unnatural flow of money into housing. Unnatural because it doesn't spank. It's long term and it's low cost. So nobody wants to put money into housing. Savings and loans right now. Read the newspaper when the Congress gets back in session. What do savings and loans want to do? They were chartered, you know, a few years ago or a century ago uh, where a lot of guys got together and pooled their money and then they lent it out into the community to get things built, to get their community built. The roads, the streets, the curbs, the gutters, the houses and all those things. It was kind of an ideal. Well, now Twin City Federal and Mr. Uh, Midwest Federal and all the other guys are out there really wailing away. People are saving money at a tremendous rate and they don't want to put money into this housing thing any longer. They can't make enough at it. They want to put it into chattel, they want to put it into mobile homes, they want to put it into anything that they can get their hands on to other than housing. And I think it would be a serious mistake in this country, and I am not speaking as a stupid economist, but from my position and my advantage point, with my prejudice, I feel it would be a serious mistake uh, in this country if we were to allow these savings institutions to, to violate the principle of lending money into the housing system. Because that's the only way people can buy houses. Nobody can pay cash for a house. You know, if we go back to the, the 20s when there wasn't any financing and say, yeah, you can have a house if you can afford to pay cash for it. Nobody bought houses because they weren't available in those days. But that's not the case today. Ownership of housing or condominium ownership or cooperative ownership or even rental uh, ownership, and I think we can call renting ownership, uh, requires uh, financing. It requires capital. Capital. So I think there, is, there lies the thrust of the federal government. And those of us that are concerned about housing, and those of us concerned about you know, living in a house someday, uh, ought to be heard and ought to challenge every move that's ever made out of the federal establishment in regards to these issues. Now, just two weeks ago, the federal government decided that subsidizing housing was a bad bet. And they pulled the carpet out from under everybody, and there ain't no more subsidization programs for 18 months, which means that all that will happen now is that our subsidization programs for the next four years under the Nixon administration, and I don't want to get into the politics of this because I think he had some justification in part in doing what he did. I don't believe that we ought to use housing as a whipping boy for this economy as we do all the time, but we do. The facts are that when we want to slow the world down, we start pulling housing starts back. Housing starts are the most, they magnify the economy. 1969, the world said, let's get this economy going. Let's make things happen. What did we do? We pumped up housing. We threw an awful lot of money into it. My guys built a lot of housing. And what did we do? We brought the nation up, you know, the gross national product, and housing was a significant contributor to that. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. It got a lot of money going. It got a lot of building activity going. And when you start a house, you start a lot of things happening. The old trailer is 15 miles long when they start to buy carpeting and drapes and refrigerators and chairs and all of these other things. Today the furniture business is at an all-time high because of the housing starts in 69 and 70. It primed the pump. It does a beautiful job. And when you want to slow things down as they want to do it right now, what do they do? What? Housing will fall flat in its face again until, you know, that whole manipulative program comes back into some kind of focus. Well, I think all my industry really is asking for give us some stability. We'd like to be able to plan the money. We'd like to be able to know that the money is going to be available there for the individuals and for the investors to, to borrow so that we can continue to build. We don't want this kind of gyration. We can't live with it. We can't make any money at it. And our values are eroded. Our, our housing values are eroded because of it. So I'm saying the federal establishment ought to, ought to develop the kinds of finance vehicles that lend stability to this business and that will provide opportunities for people that can't afford and will never be able to afford the market rate programs that are, are only available today. Okay, they usually say you can't subsidize people because when you subsidize people, bad things happen. You know, look what happened at Paradigo and St. Louis. Look what's happening in Chicago. Look what's happening in Minneapolis and St. Paul. That's the problem with subsidy. You give somebody something, they don't like it. They tear it apart. 
But I don't know exactly where we decided that it's neat for us to take all the indigenous, all the poor people, ram them into a high-rise building, poke the high-rise building up in the air, as you're doing right in behind me, a sister corporation of mine, by the way, is involved in that, and I'll blast it, you know, in private, don't invite to tell anybody. But well, I don't know where we got the idea that if we can take all the poor people and all the indigenous and all the people from one social class and ram them all into one environment and say, now you guys be happy, you got a new coat of paint, a new roof. And we ram them all in there, we put a big fence around them so I guess we can kind of watch them. Uh, you know, they might do crazy things. Well, they do exactly that. They react to that environment violently. They tear it down and destroy it. They have very little respect for it. Now, I know it's certainly what's going to happen to see the Riverside. I understand we're going to get real integration, uh, economic integration, social integration, and we're going to get all that jazz. Well, I'll believe it when I see it, because I'm not entirely certain that in our horizontal society, Minneapolis and St. Paul, the old plains, the prairie, that we can get people to live vertically, successfully. Hope to God it works, but I'm not going to, you know, not going to be amused if it doesn't. Okay, so. The problems of subsidies that everyone's pointing their finger at isn't the people. You know, there's nothing wrong with the people. The people are just saying that, hey, if you muck me in the elevator, I'm going to get mad. And that's what happens. We just can't force people of those kinds of economic needs and means together and, and, ex and expect them to make it. There ain't nothing a good coat of paint's going to do to improve the situation. So that's what everybody says. Destroy the subsidy program for housing because look what people do to it. They kick it apart, they destroy it, and it's a social disgrace, and we've got to go on and do other things. The facts are we've been subsidizing programs in this country out of the federal establishment for many years to get done that which we wanted to get done and get done successfully. The airlines are in business today because of federal <laughs> subsidy. The only reason the railroads have ever run is because of federal subsidy. Agriculture is here today because we want to eat more and eat better and all that stuff. That's good. I'm not knocking any of these things. we got places to go and people to see and things to do. We want to fly. We want to be able to do it rapidly. We want to be able to do it inexpensively. So we subsidize it. And the same thing is true with railroads and agriculture. And yes, we do subsidize middle class housing at a tremendous rate. The rate of subsidization of middle class housing is twice or three times the rate in the last few years uh, in terms of cost of the federal government uh, than was the subsidy programs that went out to poor folks. So let's try to look at that. How do we subsidize middle, middle class housing? It's made middle class housing. And that's good. I'm not knocking. I'm saying that really worked. We subsidize middle class housing by giving people an interest deduction on their federal and state income taxes for the interest that they pay. Remember that $102 a month? If you're in the 50% tax bracket, you get to whack off 50 bucks of that a month. If you're in the 25% tax bracket, you get to roll $25 a month. Remember the aggressivity we talked about? So the fatter you are and the, and the higher you are from the middle class, the bigger is your subsidy. Those guys that are making $40,000, $50,000 a year are really subsidized because of the interest deduction. Nothing wrong with it. The same thing with the property tax, the regressive tax, which means that the guy at the top of the income level gets more of a subsidy than the guy at the bottom level. Our highway grants are here in part because of subsidies. And what, are, you know, so what about highways? What's that have to do with middle class housing? Suburbia is here today. Burns will exist today because of Highway 35W. Our suburban areas are only available to people if they're accessible. And we got we want to get out there, build a highway, wrap it out there. And it's there. We need it, no question about it. But I think it's a little tough when the Burnsville guy that sits out there that I built a house for in 1963 and say, hey, I worked hard all my life. I got out here and I'm really swinging. And I don't believe we ought to subsidize anybody how to build any more roads and all that other jazz because I've got mine and let them get theirs. That's the attitudinal problem. And they, do, they forget that they're there by the sheer grace of some subsidy that provided the opportunity for this to happen. A lot of gas tax goes into highway grants. Somebody got up on me and said, hey, Lockheed, you know what you're talking about? Highways are built out of, out of gas taxes, and that ain't entirely true because I checked it out. Facts are that we do begin to subsidize highway development uh, through the tax rolls. Water and sewer grants, subsidy. Open space and park grants, subsidy. Guys out in River City, in the suburban area, can't move out there, can't build houses without a water and sewer system. You know, the old sanitary and the little box I show you, we don't use those any longer. And the only way we can get these today is by federal grants. Okay, another policy that just came out of the federal government affecting that. President Nixon just impounded all the, all the water and sewer, all the sewer funds that were to come down that Congress had 
had authorized last year that we're going to, you know, expand sewage systems and build new treatment plants and get this environment cleaned up, as uh, you know, I guess, and all these other things. But that those monies have been impounded right now. It's really incongruous to me when we got all the environmentalists on one side, hey, we got to clean up things. Now we got the federal assembly says, yeah, we've got to. And Congress has said, you bet we have to. And here's here's eleven billion dollars to do it this year. And then the president decides that no, we're not going to because it's inflationary and we've got problems. I think we've got a little hang up on priorities in the country, and I'm certain you guys understand that issue and you can talk about it very blue in the face, but I really don't understand it. I don't understand what's wrong with our social plan, what's wrong with our urban plan. It needs help, it needs money. And if we've got to take it from some other sector, I think we'd better do it because time isn't on our side any longer in terms of providing housing and producing opportunity. Okay, anyway, now, you, now you're all smart about how we, how we develop middle-class housing. It's the greatest thing that ever come down the pipe since apple pie. No question about it, it's made a strong middle sector in this country. Dominantly strong, well-housed, and reasonably affluent. Good deal for those guys. But I think we've got to move on to the issue then, and how do we take care of the rest of the cats? And I used to wail away about the priorities and talking to you guys about priorities alone inside a riot. So uh, the issues are, somehow or another, I think, with the economy as big and as large as we have, if we can develop the right kind of leadership, the right kind of positive leadership here at the local level, here at the metropolitan level, here at the state level, and here at the federal level, maybe we can get these programs working. Maybe we can begin to spend our money more wisely and get the job done. And until that leadership comes forth, I'm afraid that we're only going to have more rhetorical concerts like this about the issue. Okay, that's the federal <coughs> action. Let's talk about the state action a little bit. I did this code before we got into this code, this slide before we standardized the building codes in the state of Minnesota. We had 107 building codes at one time. I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, I say in the state, the state can work on making the, the system more efficient by standardizing codes, by standardizing those zoning ordinances, how we use our land so that the little municipalities all around here, the Golden Valleys and the Burnsvilles and the Bloomingtons, can't all decide, you know, how can we, what, let's, let's see, what can we do to invent a big fat fence that we can build around those community so nobody can get in? And that's in fact what the zoning uh, laws have in part done. And I think the state can work to begin to eliminate the regressive property tax but we could begin to do some of these things, and as we started to try to do in 1969, and we're partially successful, I'm not going to repeat this thing, you missed the whole trip. The, uh, the facts are that we were able to standardize the code, we now have one building code in the state of Minnesota, and we just began to start to work on, on these zoning ordinances, and this is a long haul, a lot of rhetoric here too. But in fact, these are the things that can come out of the state. There are a couple of other things that I'll talk about. We don't worry about the codes anymore. It, we, we introduced some things in the last legislature which would help. We're saying, we're saying the state can do some things in terms of developing clout. We said let's develop a state housing and development corporation which puts the state into the land ownership and the land development business if it needs to, ta if it needs to take place. And I'm convinced that through the powers of eminent domain, where you can buy land, write it down, and sell it back to the building fraternity, you know, under the guise of building certain kinds of housing and a certain mix of housing, that that, that kind of function works. It's working in New York in part. If you study the New York housing, uh, uh, the New York, uh, I can't remember what it's called. It's a uh, thing that came out of the 1969 New York legislature. That is a New York quasi-private public uh, development corporation that's using funds from the state uh, to get the job done. Anyway, the state can develop that kind of club. I'm saying we can also begin to, when the FHA starts to back out like it's backing out right now, FHA doesn't want to insure anybody that's a risk any longer. If you make enough money and you smile right, you've got the right kind of job and the right attitude, you can get a loan insured by the FHA and the VA. Well, they began to abdicate their role. FHA made this middle sector of housing in the 50s and 60s. It was a very dominant factor. It's beginning to wane right now. We're having all the problems in the world of getting a loan through FHA. They're just kind of saying, hey, HUD, you were there. FHA lives there. HUD is saying FHA ought not to exist any longer. We ought to kind of get out of this business because, you know, uh, for some reason we don't need it any longer. Well, if that's the case, then I think the state had better come to the cause. And we can do, a, we can do the same thing with a with either a very public or a quasi-private public kind of insuring uh, entity. We can begin to develop a state mortgage guarantee insurance corporation. I presented that to Governor Anderson uh, in his housing message. I did his housing message for him, and I was a Republican at the time. 
And I did his housing message for him that he brought to the legislature in 1971. We incorporated nine points into that message, that special message that went to the legislature in February of 71. The building code was one of them. The uh, Minnesota State Finance Agency was another one. That's a law now. It's being tested in the, in the state Supreme Court, and it'll win. And then we'll have a state housing finance agency that can put money uh, into you know, the capital pool issue, put money into the capital pool specifically for housing in Minnesota. We presented that and got beat. We presented that and got beat. But we might be back and try it again this session. Facts are that there are some things the state can do if it begins to develop an understanding and an awareness and an attitude toward housing. Uh, the tax situation we've talked about. Let's talk about the local conditions and get this thing wrapped up. We've got these basic things that I think the local community can do to help promote a broader range of housing opportunities for a broader range of people. We can encourage development. We discourage it now. We make it the most difficult thing in the world to do to bring housing on the mainstream. My God, it takes time and money and effort, and you're beat across the head and shoulders left and right, because all the people, I was in a zoning on Tuesday night, in Eden Prairie, 185 acres, wanted to build 497 housing units in Eden Prairie. And we had a public hearing, that's the forum, where all the local residents that are affected by this thing come in. And when you hear people say, I moved out here, you know, to get in the country, and I'm used to looking at that vista, that farm, I think it ought to stay as a farm. And another guy will say, what kind of housing are you going to build? Are you going to build dingbat housing? Are you going to build little houses for poor people? Room my real estate values, room what I moved out in Prairie to have. Well, that's the attitude. It's just prevalent. It comes at you at every zoning hearing. Every time you want to bring a new housing factor on board, you got somebody that's there that's saying, hey, if it ain't exactly what I live in, exactly what I'm used to, it isn't any good, and we don't want it here. And that voice rings loud and true, and it's defeated many, many housing proposals because the local attitudes are not designed to encourage development. We do not give any bonuses for excellence. Believe it or not, there are some good builders that will try to do the good job. They'll try to do their land plan right. They'll try to provide a level of amenity that works for that community. They'll try to do uh, all that they can do to, remember, hammer down those costs. We know the more we can deliver a house for, the more people we can service, and the more money we can make. Our motivation, nothing wrong with it. It keeps us alive. But we need to be we need to be paid for some of that excellence. How do we get paid for in the community? Well, if I come in with a good zingy uh, development and it has all of these facilities built into it and it's a good project, the community can help me defray those costs by giving me extra density or letting me narrow that 66 foot street down to 30 foot. There are a lot of trade offs that could be developed if our communities would turn their head on straight and decide that they ought to develop some bonus programs for excellence. They don't today, but they're going to have to if the builder is going to be able to take a little crack at the thing that he can control, the, the size of the house and his land development costs. Okay, we need to educate and change attitudes. Uh, you know, that's like asking uh, you know, a poor guy for a buck. Uh, and finance improvements. I think there are ways that we can finance the internal improvements in a community on a broad base scale using tax exempt dollars, tax exempt monies, and we can reduce the cost of housing substantially uh, if we were to look at the improvement schedule and provide the builder, <coughs> provide the developer with different kinds of vehicles to get those heavy water, sewer, and street curb, and gutter, and storm sewer facilities put in. Today it's cash. You get them put in, bang, cash, add the interest rate up, and by the time you ship the house out to the guy, that sewer pipe costs a lot of money. I'm just saying there are other alternatives to it. Little of this is deep, and it's kind of off the, off the subject, but it does kind of resolve, in my mind at least, what need be done at the local level if, in fact, we're going to get this job done. We're running out of time. We don't need to talk about those kinds of things. In summary, we've got to you know, subsidize, I think, interest rates. We've got to offer our priorities to afford that subsidy. We need to work on our codes for the building and zoning. We need to take care of the, the property tax, and I believe we have to encourage innovation. We need leadership that's positive and responsive to get it done. And by and large today, we've got all the minds in the world that are there and available, but the leadership is not that positive and is not that responsive to the issue for some of those reasons I offered before. And the major reason why things don't get done today and probably will not get done tomorrow because we've got a certain degree of myopia in this country stemming from that middle class sector, the comfortable kind of affluent sector, the decision makers, 
we're lethargic, we're affluent, we're comfortable, and when you get right down to the bottom line, if you want a one-line grabber for you know why it won't happen tomorrow, it's because they can say, I've got mine, and we'll let them get theirs. Okay, thank you. I want to talk for a while, I say you can, if you don't, it's gone. Uh, it's a pleasure. You know, you have to go back to the basic question of why, why is there zoning? And then we say there's zoning so that we can protect values. We can protect property rights. And I said it's a codification of what's there. I'm not certain we need zoning laws at all. In fact, there are some cities in this country, Houston, Texas is an example, that doesn't have any zoning laws. And you can go down to Houston, Texas, it doesn't look much different than Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, there are, there, there's probably as much need for uniformity in the zoning laws as there are to get rid of them. And I think to get rid of them is being kind of, you know, unreasonable. But I think what we ought to do is try to, uni to develop a uniformity in a region or a state. And that's precisely what we're trying to do now in, in Minneapolis, St. Paul. We're going to the Metropolitan Council, we're developing some models for the zoning ordinances. Hopefully all the communities will take them. You see, the zoning ordinance get, uh, predicts or dictates to the builder uh, how you're going to use that land and how you're going to bring that process through the maze. And in some communities, that maze might take a year. And in some communities, it might only take a couple of months. Well, they're able to use the zoning laws to distort and to deny and to control <coughs> development. But not for the reasons that the laws are invented. The laws are invented to try to protect property rights. And in fact, now we're protecting to the point where you don't let anything happen. So I think the answer to zoning is, is in uniformity. Let's develop one standard for bringing land onto use. And, and you know, when you get into that issue, then of, well, how do we decide what land is best used for what for what purpose? That becomes the gutty issue. And the local attitudes are that we want to make that decision. Nobody else can make it for us. I happen to believe that Burnsville isn't an entity unto itself. I think Burnsville is part of this metropolitan community. And the fact that Burnsville has enough industrial land zone to accommodate all the industrial development that will take place in this metropolitan area until the year 2035 is really kind of stupid. You know, all communities then zone a lot of industrial land. Why industrial is a good base? You don't bring any kids, you don't really need the fire department, the police department too much. It's cheap kind of of uh, cheap, it's very, it's very profitable kind of zoning to have if you can get you know, General Motors to move in. So I think what we have to do is look at, in terms of land use, we have to look at the metropolitan area, you know, where all the concentrations come in, and decide what is the best use of all that land, given our access programs, highways, given our transportation systems that are coming now down the pipe, given our water and sewer programs. I think we can, from on top, best decide you know, where should the residential thing take place? Where should the industrial take place? And we know it can't take place too far from one another because of the problems of transportation. It's a major issue today that goes well beyond the local little entity like Burnsville. I don't think Burnsville is capable, or Bloomington, or Edina, or any community is capable today of deciding what's best for that community in light of all the other communities that are affected by it. So I think uniformity and standardization is probably what need, need to take place. It's also to that. Has something to do with the Metropolitan Housing Development Corporation idea. I hear the reaction to that from housing development authorities in various municipalities. They, 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 they fear that a state organization will get take them out of business. Sure. No question. It's that old, you know, it's, 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 you know, when somebody has control, it's a tough thing in the world to wrestle that control from somebody. And, you know, it's a natural reaction. They say, hey, we control the destiny area now. We don't want to change that. And there's a great month, there's a great deal of fright. The real fright comes about because everybody relates their zoning control to their next door neighbor. Now, if we can maintain control, I got, I'll be certain that I don't have to live the next to any black folks or poor folks, because I'll zone them out. So they don't want to lose that control. It's very precious to people. And that's an attitudinal problem. It goes to this whole issue of attitudes, which are going to be long-term changing. But I think we're going to have to. We're going to frustrate this system so much and we're going to confuse the system so much with the sprawl, the fragmented sprawl, that someday we're going to wake up and say, my God, what a mess. I'm just saying maybe we ought to get smart and decide that, that we're going to have a mess and let's not let it happen.
But you're right. There's a, there's a chance for getting this build through this much like this. It looks much better than last night. Well, I think it looks better right now because the federal government says there aren't any more subsidized funds. So, you know, we might be able to slip it through because no one has to worry about it. Because, you know, without subsidized funds, there ain't no, no, no housing built for poor folks at all. There will not be any more housing built for poor folks that isn't already online. So, uh, I think if it happens, it might happen this time. Uh, we're going to, you know, go back and try to get it done. You never know. The, the legislature is still a rural legislature. It doesn't even understand the problems in the metropolitan area. And because of that representation over there, we're not capable of really getting good, stiff metropolitan issues rammed through. They don't care. You go to subcommittees and you've got 14, and I know they're all farmers again, but you know they don't understand the problems that we have here in the city. You get 14 guys at a subcommittee hearing at 7.30 in the morning, and they're... You know, they're sleeping on the issue. We got problems out here, you know, and it's really disturbing. So I don't know if we'll make it or not. I know that the majority of them over there, if they, you know, wake up, uh, probably would decide that who needs it. And if you can smoke one through, it's this session, probably. Came close last time. Anything else? On the subsidized policy you're talking about, you said the freeway. There's those little white houses with a uh, cancer on them. Yeah. It's on 24th. I don't know anything about it. I didn't, I didn't talk about that specific project. I'm saying is that what we've done today, what the Housing Act of 19, if the Housing Act of 1968 failed, it didn't fail because of its subsidy programs. That worked fantastically well. It started a lot of people into housing. But what we said and what the community said is that, well, if we're going to build any subsidized housing, let's put them all together. And I use the slang term or the slang feeling of we put them all together so we can watch them. But what do we do when we when we concentrate uh, that form of home ownership? You have to remember now these are basically people that have never owned a home before, don't know how to maintain it, have no understanding of the of the problems and the inequities that come out of home ownership, and aren't prepared for it. So when we put them all together, they got nobody they can talk to, or they've got no norm they can go out and look at. Uh, we represented to. Uh, to Mondale and Brook uh, a year ago that uh, it was part of the 1970 Housing Act, which is, you know, failed, that we ought to subsidize individuals and not the box. Let the individual take the script out and go find a house or rent a box wherever he wants to and assimilate himself into society. I don't know if that'll work, but I think it's a better program than what we have, but we still need subsidy because it's the only way the cat's going to be able to buy anything. So uh, if we're saying subsidizing the box, the white houses, and the big tall buildings doesn't work, okay, let's not, but let's not forget the people. And let's try another program. Right now we're playing ostrich, put our head in the sand and say, oh, it's, you know, it'll go away. Hell, it's not gonna go away, it's gonna run right over us one of these days. We haven't, we don't, we haven't had a Detroit or a Watts in Minneapolis yet. You know, if there's only way, some way that we could simulate the disaster, if there was some way we could take all the guys in Minneapolis and St. Paul and make decisions, put them into a room, and then somehow or another, on a panoramic screen, simulate the disaster. Burn Franklin Avenue down, you know, or whatever, what have you. Uh, gee, I don't want anybody to do that. But I'm saying if there were a way to simulate that, we could begin to see that our ostrich position is only going to hurt us eventually. And just get smart. Let's get out in front of the problem. But until you're affected, you know, until you have a kid that can't rent a house, or can't buy a home, or you have a parent that has to move in with you, because you can't afford it, you know, live by himself, you're not affected. And that's the whole center system in this country right now, people that aren't affected by the issue. When we are affected, what do we do? Super job. Sputnik went up, we were affected. What do we do? Whammo, we got to the moon 50 times. Spent a ton of money. We were affected. We got the job done. <laughs> this nation has the, still the most fantastic ability to get done whatever it wants to get done. My only cause is, you know, let's bring housing over here and put it into the main, the mainstream. Urban, the urban planet. Let's want to get that done. And when we decide that we want to get it done, we will. I think it's going to have to take the disaster. It's going to have to take that to bring this issue out and to get it accomplished. And until that happens, I think again, all the rhetoric is just going to be a lot of fun and we get more screaming. Yes. We'll be an optimist, but what kind of uh, commitments do you see coming out of Washington? Now well, I'm not very smart, and I don't, I don't really know. I don't think you're going to see any commitment come out in the next two years that will make any any sense at all. And I wouldn't be surprised at all 
I, you know, let me, I guess I should, I am fired up to think about one thing. I think what we've seen, and this could be good, President Nixon is saying, you know, we, we, we're, we're paternalistic. We've gone to the feds for everything we've ever wanted, and the feds at best screw the programs up. So uh, he starts to cut off HEW and HUD kinds of programs, and he's really saying, hey, states and local communities, the problem is yours. Now, we're going to divert some funds down there for you, and you handle a problem. Don't come to Washington for it. I think that's a smart move. It's a very difficult move because the direction isn't that good. He's just saying, stop the world, you figure out the problem. The direction, you know, I'd, I'd really be a pro-Nixonite if he would, if he did what he did and then gave direction and implementation and programming that would work at the state and local level. But right now we've laid it bare and we got all of these guys, these mayors and these governors and everybody standing around all of a sudden figuring out that when they lose all those federal programs, the special revenue sharing and the revenue sharing funds that are coming down the other side, it's about like this difference. It's very small. It means the states and the local level are going to have to come in and pump it up, make it happen. And we know they're not going to do it until that disaster starts poking at them. So I don't see that you're going to get any programs out of the federal establishment during Nixon's regime unless Congress becomes awfully uptight and can you know, begin to override the veto that uh, will alter that course at all. I believe Nixon believes that housing is a local issue, state is a local issue, and that it ought to be handled there. I kind of agree with him if he would give direction and if he would also do what he has to do, and that's maintain that capital pool, because that we can't do at the state level or the local level. The airlines are local issue. Pardon? The do the airlines are local issue. No, but it's a moderate issue, and it's a, and it's a middle class issue. And what the middle class wants, we get. You know, he doesn't argue with that. The middle class aren't arguing for housing. You know, there's no boodle connected with housing. Have you ever seen a politician come out and cut a ribbon on a, on a new subdivision? There's no way to get a vote out of housing. That's a very, very basic. There's no boodle connected with housing. Now, if there's a way we could tie boodle to housing, what's boodle? You know, that's money that goes into election funds and all that other jazz. Uh, if there, and, you know, flow. If there's any way to tie that to housing, I think then we'd have housing on the airline issue. There's boodle connected with, with agriculture and airlines and railroads and middle class housing, but there ain't no boodle connected with low cost housing. <laughs> Maybe that's what we had about the poodle system. <laughs> yes, sir. Ma'am. Miss. Can I make reference to the um, reasons why people felt this so hard to be in the city and, and try to. Um, to okay, take, remember that beast that was looking down the Mojave Desert there? Uh, he can't see any opportunities in the city area. There's no direction and there's no programming, there's no accommodation for him. We are not philanthropists. None of us got enough money to come in and to handle all the problems of the inner city in terms of aggregating land and aggregating market. Now, if somebody can aggregate land and aggregate market, the private sector will come in and zing. But until that's done or accomplished, you won't find us here. We just can't do it. You try to buy five square city, city blocks in the city of Minneapolis. Well, that's what they did at Cedar Riverside. It took them 10 years. And the only way they got bailed out of there is because there was a federal program to bail them out. That federal program hadn't been there, you know, you must have tear that building down tomorrow because it doesn't live. So there was a, you know, the federal government doing what it can do with its money, and the private sector doing what it can do in terms of its ability to take a lot of time to put land together and then to make, um, you know, the private sector react and, and bring housing on. I think we got, you know, bills back here, and I've been taking shots at Cedar Riverside. I'm not taking a shot at it. I'm just saying that I think there's some very deep problems in that project that haven't been very well thought out. And they might work, but uh, and if it works, it'll work because of the uniqueness of this location. Right. You know, it's a very unique site. It's in the mainstream of a hubbub of activity. It's got all the cultural attitudes and it's got all all of those things going for it. It probably will make it. Yeah, we've all got a skewed market in the back. We've got the empty nesters because they're the professors, the professionals, and we've got the students. We haven't got anybody who's never afraid. I could tell you another thing that's free for the morning, and it's been my experience knowing the developers at both Reston and Columbia, and Jonathan, that uh, there are no economics in those programs that make sense at all either. It's a very expensive, it's a very difficult process. Now, if they told you they're making a lot of money, they're lying, because they haven't, and they won't. And Gulf Oil went into Reston, put in $75 million just you know, for starters into that project. And you know, would like to get out of it so bad, so fast, so quick, and ain't nobody else around ready to buy the turkey. 
And Columbia will make it because it's in the center of, of urban exploitation, literally. That's the center of an urban mass, I mean. We got GE East down the line, hiring some thousands and thousands of people. We got Baltimore and Washington. It'll be the one new town that makes it. But it'll make it uh, probably more heavily on the moderate and uh, upper side than it will the low side. Although they have a mix in there, it's not too bad. But uh, that's a long term project, too. And the only reason it's going to cut it is because it's in the center of that urban mass. So uh, the, the Jonathans, uh, my estimation, aren't going to make it because it's not in the center of an urban mass. And except for the federal funds right now, which gives it time, you know, to exist, I don't think there's any particular need or encouragement for people to drive that far out and live. We got all of Eden Prairie in the way, all that land, and they didn't got nothing out there that's that much better than what we're going to be able to develop inside them and cut away of. So the Newtown phenomenon in this country uh, is not the same as it is in England or Europe, because their uh, housing is structured much differently. It's kind of a forced housing issue in those countries. Today, housing is not forced in this country except for the poor folks. So I don't think that the Newtown uh, phenomenon, you know, I assume you've had a good time studying it, uh, ought to be dispensed with. I think it's necessary and it's going to continue to happen, but it's not very economical. And the private side is going to have a very difficult time getting enthused about doing any more of it. Well, <clears throat> I appreciate the opportunity, and I guess it's time to go to work. Thank you.